subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Welcome to SHSR on Joy Lane channel. I am Adriana Benyabua and I will be taking you through government like I said before. In our previous lesson, we met some concepts we were going to become very familiar with, with government. We talked about what government was and how it was relevant to our lives as well as our future careers. So then we'll go on to a different topic. These are what we call basic political concepts. These are concepts we are going to meet as we go through the entire three years of SHS life with regards to government. Today we will talk about what a society is. I would want to understand that some of us may have heard the word society and would have had our own ideas about what it is. With regards to government and to political science, we say a society is a relatively large and independent group of people who have a common heritage that is transmitted from one generation to the other. This group interacts with each other socially in a structured relationship in an attempt to pursue common objectives for the good of the group. Societies could be living together through kinship relations, social interest, religious interest, or any common interest. So when we say a society, we are talking about a group of people who are largely related through a common heritage, sometimes through social interactions or social interests, religious interests or any common interest. We can find such societies in our churches, in the areas in which we live, sometimes even in schools. I would want to believe that some of us have some groups like girl child societies, um, blood crescent, red cross, and a whole lot of them. Let's see if we can align these groups or kinds of societies to the features of a society. When we say a feature, we are talking about the characteristics of something that makes us distinct or different from other societies or human living. Relatively, we say that this is a large group. And in today's world, we would find that due to modernization and technology, society go beyond what we call um, a social group based in a particular territory it goes beyond that because of technology people can form societies online and all that then we also say that societies are controlled by rules and regulations which affect only the members when i say this i would want to relate it to the fact that when people are members of a particular society the rules and regulations that govern that particular society or that reigns without that particular society is only for the members and not for everybody so for example if you were a member of the of a, a group in a church which is a society and those and those rules that are made in that society is only for the members it means that it is not the entire church who will be affected by those rules and regulations another feature of a society is that membership is not compulsory you can choose to be a member you can choose not to be nothing binds you to this particular arrangement based on the particular objective of the group if you feel it's not going to be that important to you then there will be no need for you to be a member of that group so a society has a common culture or heritage now when we say culture we are talking about the lifestyle of a group of people at a particular time and so when we say a common culture we are talking about the fact that this group of people known as a society have a common culture they do things the same way they act in the same way they they live in the same way they have also what we call a common heritage a society is also autonomous to an extent um, with regards to this, we are talking about the fact that a society is allowed to operate independently without the intrusion of outside forces or, outside, or outsiders. But the fact is this, that if we find a society in another kind of human society that is larger than a society, then definitely it wouldn't be too autonomous. Let's have an assumption that kind of society is abusing the rights of other people in uh, a particular group or a particular society. Society. That would mean that the outside world would have to budge in or would have to interrupt in the affairs of this particular group known as a society. And therefore, it is autonomous, though it is independent to an extent, but not totally independent. We also say that 
most societies enjoy what we call permanence. Um, in most cases, we say that they enjoy some, some long reign or long um, periods of reign so that they become relevant to the good of the people. Now, we say that compliance with rules and regulation is ensured by sanctions such as suspensions and fines and not force. A little interesting here. When we talk about a society, we are talking about a group of people who are governed by rules and regulations. They are put into action with the use of the rules and regulations set up by the society, agreed by all members of the society. But this is it, that when a member flaunts or a member misbehaves, sanctions such as suspensions and fines are, are placed. And so if the person would still want to be a member of the group, the person will have to go through the suspension and come back. Or would have to pay the fines and still be back. But you cannot use force. You can't say that because a member has misbehaved in a group, the person should be um, sent to jail. No, except that it infringes on the rights of um, humanity. Now that we know what a society is, there is another larger group known as a nation. Now, I think that we've heard of the word nation, nation all over the place. And we have, in most cases, interchanged it with another word or another concept. When we say a nation, a nation comes from the Latin word natus, meaning birth. Now, you know what birth is. Giving birth to something new or to a new baby. And therefore, it brings about the sense of belonging. This meaning depicts a group of people with a common sense of belonging from common race, historical experience, and religion. This group may, not, may or may not be necessarily in line or may not be necessarily living in a single territory. When we say nation, we say it can also be explained as a group of people on account of their linguistic, historical, and cultural values. When we say this, we are saying that when we say a nation, a nation means a group of people who come together or who are living, sometimes not in the same territory, but have a sense of belonging. The fact that they belong to each other or they belong to a particular group. Okay. They belong to a particular group. When we talk about a nation, we are talking about a group of people with a common sense of belonging. The fact that they belong to a particular group, they are related to each each other even though they may not be coming from the same heritage or from the same ancestry they may have come from a common race from a common historical experience or sometimes through religion and therefore we say that these people share what we call sometimes linguistic historical and cultural values we can also say that a nation is explained as a large group of people who by historical experience language, culture, religion or racial relations, believe that they have a common ancestry. They may or may not be living together in the same geographical boundary. So we have some examples, like the Jewish nation. These are a group of religious people who live or who are related through historical experiences as well as religious relations and sometimes are found within a particular historical or a particular geographical background they may be living all over the world there are jewish uh, there are jewish people people who believe in Jew judaism all over the world but they would have to say that they are jewish people because they feel that they come from a common ancestry all right which is israel jacob then we'll talk about the islamic nation so when we talk about the islamic nation we are talking about People who believe that they are descendants of Muhammad and therefore have a common ancestry. They have a common language. To be exact, they speak Arabic. In most of their dealings as a religious group, you find them using the Arabic language. They are believed to have, have a common culture, even with their dressing, their kind of the food they eat and the things they do with regards to religion makes you know or would make you know that they are a nation. Then we'll talk about the Ashanti nation. This is a group of people who are large, we will call them a large group of people who are found within a particular geographical 
um, background or uh, geographical limit limits. And you would see that they have a common language, they uh, have a common culture. Religiously, they are one, racially, we we'll say the Africans though, but they are a nation on their own. All right, so now that we know what a nation is, let's see if the features we are going to outline here will fit into the kinds of examples I have given. Now we say that the features of a nation, first of all, is a national homeland, or what we call a well-defined territory. Let's talk about the Jewish nation. We say that they believe that their homeland is Israel, all right, which is a well-defined territory on the map. We'll talk about the Islamic nation, and we say that they relate that their homeland or their native land is Mecca, and Mecca is on the globe. And therefore, we say that one feature, a major feature of a nation, is its national homeland. Another one is what we call a common cultural heritage. The fact that they behave and do their things with regards to a specific heritage. That the fact that they relate to a particular ancestry and believe that that is how things are to be done within that particular group of people. The third one I want to talk about, very interestingly, is a common language. Every nation has its own language whether it is spoken within or outside that particular territory. So when we talk about the Jewish people, we say in most cases, they speak a language peculiar to the people of Israel. And then we talk about the Islamic nation. We are talking about the fact that they speak specific languages, specifically the Arabian language or Arabic. Then we talk about the Ashantis, which is quite common. And we know that they speak their country. And so we know that one feature of a nation is common language. Another one is that they have a common origin. I, I think that in our previous slide, we saw that we said that a nation is bound by a particular origin. They all believe that we come from somewhere, even though they may be living in other places on the earth. And therefore, we say they have a common origin. They have what we call ethnic unity amongst themselves. And with their relation with other people, they try to be peaceful and create a peaceful environment in the places where they are so that people would want to join or would want to be part of them. Then they also have historical experiences as one of their major features. Now, when we talk about historical experiences, it means that they may have come from somewhere or they may have originated from somewhere. And to this end, they may have gone through some experiences that may have given them a common historical experience. And that gives them the advantage of being a nation. Then they have what we call the consciousness of togetherness. I would have loved to add another group, but I would prefer to use the Islamic group or the Islamic nation and the Jewish nation as well as the Ashanti nation. And you realize that everywhere you meet these groups of people known as a nation, whether within what we call their geographical boundaries or out of their geographical boundaries, you would realize that they are always or they would always want to be known as one people. And therefore, there is the issue of they being so conscious of being together and knowing that people know that they are one people. Now, when you go to the Islamic communities, you would see them, the consciousness of togetherness being there. That even when they meet themselves outside, they know that this is who this is or this is this person and it's part of the nation from which I belong. And so if I gave you time to tell me some differences or to align some differences between a society and a nation, I guess that you'll be able to give me about 10 reasons why a society is different from a nation based on what we have seen earlier on. The next one I would want us to be more specific about now is what a state is. I'm not talking about state of matter, not science, but we are dealing with government. And we see that it is different from the word state in which we use for science. So when we talk about a state, we say a state is a clearly defined geographical area over which an independent or sovereign political authority has been established. When we say this, what it means is that a state is an area or a geographical area which is well defined. So for example, Ghana is defined in terms of land size, which we call its geographical area in relation to um, the sub-region in which it is, in, in relation to the world as a whole. And so we can boldly say that to our east and to our west and to our north and to the, and to the south, 
we are bordered by certain countries that determine the expanse or how big Ghana looks like. And so when we talk about this, the entire world knows that these are geographical boundaries. And we say that this is a land size over which an independent or sovereign political authority has been established. In our subsequent or in our former, in one of our classes, we made mention of the fact that government can be known or government as a term can also be used in reference to an institution of the state, which is legislative, executive, and the judicial arms of government. In this sense, this is what we are referring to, that it is a sovereign political authority. That is, that is also to say that it is the people of that state that gives this authority to its rulers to be able to manage its affairs. In detail, we can say that a state is a well-defined territorial area that has established laws, its own population, it is sovereign, and an organized government with the authority to pass and enforce laws over its people. When we say this, we are only meaning that, like I said earlier on, a state is a well-defined territory. It means that geographically it can be located. And within this particular area of jurisdiction, it has its own established laws, its own population. It means that it has citizens. It is sovereign, which means it is independent and has an organized government with the authority to pass and enforce laws over its own people without outside interference. And so let's talk about the features of a state, which makes it different from a society, which makes it different from a nation. I hope you are taking um, recognition of all these differences. One of the features of a state is that it has a defined territorial space or a defined territory. When I say so, I think I've already explained this, but for emphasis, let me go over it again. That when we say a state, it is a well-defined state, a state has its own geographical boundaries. Territorially, it can be located such that nobody can encroach on its land. For example, in Ghana to the east, we have Togo. With regards to its border lines. To the west, we have Cote d'Ivoire with its border lines, showing the demarcation of how far or how wide Ghana is. To the north, by Burkina Faso, and to the south, by the Gulf of Guinea. And so we say that Ghana can be defined or can be classified as a state, knowing that it has a well-defined territory. Then you remember that we said that a society does not demand compulsory membership. But when we talk about a state, a state has its population known as citizens. And with this one, whether you like it or not, so once you, you are born here or you qualify to become a citizen, compulsorily you become a citizen. Now, when we say citizenship, we are saying membership of a particular country. When one has membership of a particular country, the person is a citizen. So in Ghana, for example, compulsorily, once you are born to either a Ghanaian parent or a grandparent, you are compulsorily a Ghanaian. That one is, is what it is. Then we talk about sovereignty. The fact that a state is, should be able to self-govern itself, should be independent, should be able to make its own laws, and enforce it on its people without outside interference. It should be able to govern itself such that the entire world would acclaim or would know that it is an independent state. Then we can also say that it has its own established laws, which is their constitution. Now the constitutions are the laws and regulations and rules that governs the particular state. In constitutions, we can find the rights as well as the responsibilities and privileges people enjoy as being members or foreigners of a state. And therefore, with a state, it must have its own laws. It must have its own laws that helps in its governing and to maintain law and order in that particular state. Then it must have government. When I say government here, I hope you understand now. We are now talking about the institution known as government which is there to make sure that there is a good management of the affairs of the state, without which there will be chaos. Then it says that most states of the world enjoy permanence, that it enjoys what we call perpetuity, the fact that it could be there for a very long time, 
Now, Ghana as it is used to be something else before it became Ghana. After independence, we were then known as the Gold Coast. So there we are still Ghana and we are still moving on. We are enjoying a form of perpetuity, the fact that we are still in being, whether we like it or yes. Then we'll talk about the fact that we should be recognized as a state, recognition. Now all over the world, people must recognize these features we have defined up here to make people know that yes, this is a state. We are different from a nation. We are different from a society. And so I'll go over it again. We say that every state have, must have a defined territory, must have its own people, which is its population, must be sovereign, must have established rules, which is its constitution, must also have a, governance over, a government over it or a, governan, a governing body over it that makes it more viable and more good and therefore we also talk about the fact that it must also enjoy permanence and recognition below i have explained or i also have given some examples of what a state is ghana is a special state ghana is a good example of a state nigeria can also be known as a state togo burkina faso add more of them as you sit at home please write more of these as much as you can there are a lot of states in the world all right, now that we know what a state is, and we have understood some of its features, let's talk about the purpose for which a state is in being. Now, for example, in Ghana, Ghana is a state because one, it is independent, it is sovereign, it has a well-defined territory, it enjoys permanence, it has its own people, and a lot more. Now let's talk about the purpose of a state. The first one is the maintenance of law, order, and security. In most cases, or in all cases, we say that the state is there to ensure that its citizens abide by the laws that it makes. Remember we said that a state has the power to make its own laws and enforce them in the state because one, it's a sovereign. I hope we have understood that. And therefore, when it makes the law, or when it makes laws or regulations to govern the order of society, it should be able to maintain these laws so that people do not abuse the rights of others. By so doing, there's going to be order, and there's also going to be security, there's going to be security in the state. With regards to this, we'll talk about the laws we have in our states which gives us so many advantages of being feeling the feeling of being secure so that we do not feel as if anybody is going to infringe on our rights. Another one related to the maintenance of law and order is that it is also the state is there to protect the fundamental human rights of its citizens. Before then, I told us that when we say a citizen, a citizen is a member of a state or a country. We can interchange the word state and country. But in most cases, whether it is sovereign or it is not, it is a country. Now, when we talk about a state, we say that one of its purpose or one of its aims is to protect the fundamental human rights of its people. When we say this, we only mean that the state is there to make sure that people enjoy their rights to the fullest without being abused or infringed upon. There are certain checks that are put in place so that people can enjoy their rights to the maximum without feeling as though they are going to be abused. One of such rights fundamentally is the right to life. When we say right to life, we are only talking about the fact that every human being and it is also, let me put this right, it is one of the, the laws under the, the UN Charter or the rules that govern the United Nations or members of the United Nations Organization. Now, when we talk about this, right to life means that every human being has the right to live his life. Nobody has the right to take away the life of another. The only person or the only authority that has the right to take another's life, even that is through the due process of the law. And therefore, you cannot commit suicide. It is against the fundamental rights of the people, even though you might say your life is yours. But the moment you are born into a particular state, you are bona fide property of that state. 
and therefore you cannot take your life. Another person cannot take your, take your life or the life of another person. It is another fundamental right we are enjoying, right to life. And therefore, when you go to the courts, you would ask the judges and the lawyers, and they will tell you that if somebody murders another person, the person has taken or has abused somebody's fundamental right, that is right to life. And therefore, it is the state against the murderer or the accused person. And therefore, we have the right to enjoy. Another fundamental human right we enjoy as humans is freedom from torture, that we are not supposed to be treated inhumanly. It is the duty of the states or the purpose of the state to make sure that the rights of citizens are well protected and can enjoy their life to the maximum, becoming productive for the betterment of the state in which they are. Another purpose of the state is to provide welfare services. When we say welfare services, well, our minds may go elsewhere, no social welfare here. We are talking about some services that helps in the development of the state. One of them is education, another is health, um, we'll talk about transportation and a whole lot of them. And we say that it is the purpose of the state to provide these welfare services so that the people of the states can live meaningful life. It is also for the good of the people. Then we'll talk about a very vital purpose of the state. It is to provide employment. Now we say that one of the responsibility of members of a state is to pay taxes. But if they do not work or they do not have means of employment, how do they pay taxes? Now these taxes are used to build roads, to maintain our hospitals and our schools, to pay government officials so that they can manage the state. But if a person doesn't work, how does a person pay tax? So we say that the purpose of a state is to make sure that it provides employment opportunities for people so that they will be able to make meaningful contributions to the growth of that particular state. I am not referring to a society, I am referring to a state. Another purpose is that it should be able to administer justice. The last time we met, we said that the organ responsible for the administration of justice is the judiciary. Before here, we saw a slide that said that one purpose of the state is to protect the fundamental rights of the people. And so, to be able to maintain law and order, as well as protect the rights of the people, there must be an administration that deals with fairness in terms of justice. And so when people may have been accused, may have infringed on the rights of others, the due process of the law must be adhered to. This is where people are placed before a judicial system and they are put to justice, the right to justice, fairness, so that everybody is at peace with each other in the state. Then it is also the purpose of the state to defend itself. By defending itself, it has in place the military, which is the army, the navy, and the air force. We have several territories that should be protected. And by protecting it, we are also defending the state against external aggression or external attack. We say we are bordered all around us by countries. And sometimes other countries can also come in through the air. Others come in through the sea. And so we are protected on all sides. Therefore, we say that one purpose of the state is to defend, the, is to defend itself against external aggression so that its people are protected from all sides. Another purpose of the state is to enact laws. In the last time we met, we said that it is a legislative arm of government. That is, in Ghana, we we'll call them parliament. It is the duty of parliament, as I will put it, to enact laws, which solely means to make laws. Make laws that are current, are binding, and are beneficial to the people of a state. And therefore, it is also a purpose of the state. Then we also see that the purpose of the state is to formulate and implement policies for the good of its people. We have already established the fact that, that in a state, there are people who live there. And these people are either foreigners or they are citizens. To this effect, the 
executive arm of government would formulate policies or formulate ideas that would help the people grow better, develop faster, and make sure that the people live in coordination to the affairs of the state. It helps by so doing, by implementing these policies that are formulated by the executive. I quite remember telling us that the executive was made up of the president and the vice with regards to the presidential system of government. We'll talk about cabinet, the civil service, and the security agencies. This is what pertains in Ghana. This is what is in Ghana. That is our executive arm of government. And their duty or their main duty is to formulate. A part of them formulates and a part of them would implement. So the president and cabinet as well as the vice president will sit down, put down ideas. We call it the formulating of a policy. And then remember, I also told you that nothing can be done in this state, in a state like Ghana, without the approval of parliament. And so this particular idea will be sent to parliament and parliament will debate on it. And when it is approved, it will come back to the executive arm of government. When it comes, it is going to a section of it known as the civil service. Now the civil service, as we all know, well, most of us do not know, but the civil service is the implementation part or the section that implements policies for the executive. So we call them in Ghana, we call them the ministries. Mention as many as you can. I guess some of you would say Ministry of Education, because that is where we all are now. Ministry of Health, Ministry of Defense, and a, whole, and a very important one, Ministry of Finance. Yes, very, very, very important. And so when these policies that have been formulated goes to Parliament and it is approved, it comes to these ministries and then they are implemented. When we say implemented, they are put into action for the good of the people. Then we'll talk about one very important purpose of the state, the promotion of morality. The society thrives on morality. The societies can grow or not grow. They can develop or not develop when its morality is at stake. A country grows faster, or sorry, I would say, well, not too sorry about that, but a state grows faster when it is highly or morally correct or morally right. All right, and so we'll go on to the next thing. Now that we know what a state is, we know what society is, and we know what a nation is, I want us to cast our minds back to our previous lesson, government as an institution of state. We want to see if there are some differences between what a state is and what a government is. The first one I want to discuss is that a state enjoys permanence while a government is temporal. If you remember, I told you that, that a government is an institution that has certain officials. And once they are human, and once there's a constitution that determines who is who, or who assumes what office, it would also tell us the number of years or the duration or tenure of office of these government officials. So like we said earlier on, the state would always be there. But government is temporal. It will keep changing. I'll take our minds back from 2000, in the very beginning of 1993 or 92, we keep changing governments. So the NDC government came, the NPP government came, the NDC government went, the NDC government went. But Ghana is still where it is. We are still a state. Then we say that a state is permanent and stable or it is a permanent and stable entity within which the government operates. So the state is permanent and stable. Ghana has always been like this. All right. Ghana has always been as it is. Its territories haven't changed. Its sovereignty hasn't changed. Nothing has changed. A few activities have come in and gone or has, has happened and has left. But Ghana is still Ghana and we are where we are. It is a stable entity. It doesn't move. It doesn't change. But the government in which, within which it is, or the government which is in power, would operate as it should operate. It will operate as the legislative arm of government. It will operate as the executive, as well as the judicial arm of government. It will come with officials, and they will occupy certain offices. But at a point in time, they would exit and a new form or a new set would take over. 
Then we say that governments come and leave, and yet the state remains within its geographical boundaries. I guess this time we understand this so well. That governments will come and go. They will go into power, they will do their work, and then they would leave, and another set will take over.